He's very involved in that, and but he has church in his home. And to me, you've lost and missed the whole biblical concept of what the church is and what what the church does. Now, we, and I, I, I'm assuming that we're on the same page with this, we're part of a body of Christ called Grace Baptist Church. We're part of a group of people who see significance in being part of a unit, part of a church, local church. Now, as these, we're going to study about Paul's first missionary journey. As they went out, as they went out, what were they doing? They were preaching the gospel. People were being saved. But what were they doing in relation to a church? They were planting churches. Everywhere they went, they planted churches. Fay and I were had the joy of being involved in <clears throat> volunteer mission work before we ever went to the foreign mission field. And we, we spent a couple of uh, uh, mission trips down in Venezuela. Uh, we, uh, but we were always connected to a church. And we would hear of, of people organizing a, uh, a mission trip <clears throat> and they were going to go somewhere and maybe do an evangelistic movement in, maybe in a community. Or maybe they were hold, going to hold a big tent meeting. And, and they would have hundreds and hundreds of people converted. And then they leave. People born into the family of God, but nobody to give them connection or direction or anything else. Sure, they saved. And what would happen, and we saw this happen when we were with the Foreign Mission Board, the cults began to just swallow them up and just suck them right in because they're not connected to a church. The New Testament plan is always connected to the local church. So when we start studying about Paul and others on these journeys, going out and preaching the gospel, we must always remember they are planting churches. Now, Brother Steve alluded to it a little bit this morning as we continue on the weeks to come. We're not only going to see churches being planted, but we're going to see Paul and others revisiting those churches, going back to strengthen them and to encourage them. Maybe to straighten out some kind of doctrinal issue. But they were always dealing <coughs> with a, a local assembly of people, a church. And that is so vital for us to, to understand as we walk into this today about Paul's first journey. Now, take your Bible. And I, I'm going to actually start in Acts chapter 8. Now we're going to be sort of jumping through this. So uh, you, you try to, you keep up with me. And uh, did you enjoy Dr. Parker last week? Isn't that an amazing man? He amazes me every time I'm around him. And I take advantage of every opportunity that I have to pick his brain. And uh, I'll, I'll run across something, that, and I just have a, you know how my mind just goes crazy, and I'll have to go ask him a question. He always has an answer. He always has a good answer. All right. Early on, early on in the life of the first century church, the scattering, you remember the scattering after the stoning of Stephen? The scattering caused by the persecution, carried the gospel into all kinds of other areas. Now, I just want us to look at a few of those. In Acts chapter 8, I'm not going to take time to, to read it all, but in Acts chapter 8, we, re, we read about Philip. You remember? Philip was, what was his position in the church? He was a deacon, one of the first deacons. So, Philip is now in Samaria, what happened in Samaria? Great revival. 
many, many people, it says, many turned to the Lord. And right in the midst of all that, what happened to Philip? You remember? The Holy Spirit did what? Yeah, just snatched him up and took him, told him to go down to Gaza, out in the desert, because he wanted him to encounter a man from Ethiopia. And that man from Ethiopia was led to the Lord and came to know the Lord. Then the Spirit took Philip. Now, in Samaria, conversions. In the desert, conversions. Now, he couldn't connect the Ethiopian to a church. He sent him back home. He was a missionary to Ethiopia, I guess. But then the Spirit takes Philip on to Azotus and eventually on to Caesarea. In Acts chapter 9 and chapter 10, Peter, you remember, we studied about this last week, went to Lydda. While he was at Lydda, he was then moved down to Joppa and then you remember he went to Caesarea to talk to a man by the name of Cornelius. So missionary work is going on. Missionary efforts is spreading. It's, it's moving out into the rest of the world. In Acts chapter 11 we're told and just simply says various believers. Doesn't name them. But some of these believers that were scattered because of the persecution from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Phoenicia. Went to Cyprus, went to Antioch, preaching the gospel. Also in Acts chapter 11, one of those that went to Antioch was Barnabas. Barnabas. Then Barnabas left Antioch and went to Tarsus to get Paul, or Saul, as he was known at that time. And then the two of them, he took Saul, and they went back to Antioch in chapter 11 of Acts. While they were at Antioch, Barnabas and Saul took an offering given by the church at Antioch to take to Jerusalem to aid and help the believers there. Then they came back to Antioch, and this time they brought someone with them, John Mark. John Mark. So the church at Antioch then gathered in chapter 13, let's look at that. Chapter 13. Now there were, verse 1. Now there were at Antioch in the church. In the church. Notice that. In the church. These pastors, these apostles, these deacons were coming and going. But what they were establishing, again, were churches. The, the, the value of the church, the significance of the body of the church, the local church in local communities with local people, that's how God has put together, that's how the Lord Jesus Christ has put together the whole task of performing Matthew 28, 19 and 20. How else could the command of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, that we call the Great Commission, how else could it be done? If we were just all lone rangers, the only place that could ever be accomplished for, with me would be in my own circles of influence. But he said, be witnesses in Judea and Samaria unto the uttermost parts of the earth. My circles of influence do not cover the uttermost parts of the earth. So somebody else has got to cover that circle of influence. I can't do that. So how, did, how in the mind of God is this ever going to be accomplished? Accomplished through his church 
to his churches. <laughs> now there were at Antioch in the church there was there prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon who was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the church, the church, worshiping, fasting, praying, the church, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they, the church, when the church had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they reached Sol Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. That's John Mark, not the Apostle John. So here they are, sent out. Who are they sent out by? The church. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Chosen by the Holy Spirit. But they're sent out by the church. So we have the, the, the example of the church sending out missionaries. The example of the church sending out representatives to places where the church cannot go. We grasp that concept pretty quickly, don't we? That's how it works. That's how it works. <clears throat> Three years before we were appointed, the Holy Spirit began to work on us the second time we were in Venezuela to make it just a desire of our hearts, Faye and I, uh, to be involved in foreign mission. At the time, it was an impossibility. There was no way that could happen because there were too many things that had to be done. Did you? I had to have more education, both of us. We had to have uh, a clear. You 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 could not be appointed as, as a missionary with Southern Baptist Convention if you had any unsecured debt. So, all of that had to be cleared out. Education had to be got. All kinds of things had to be done. But when the day came for us to leave our church, we were pastors. The church sent us out. Literally, the church sent us out. At our appointment service, in Richmond, the Foreign Mission Board sent us out. The Foreign Mission Board is a representative of 44, 45,000 Southern Baptist churches. So in a sense, 44, 45,000 churches sent us out. That's the way the Scripture put it together. That's how it's supposed to be. If I wanted to send a missionary out, I couldn't. I couldn't send somebody to the mission field and say, you go, I'll support you, I'll pay your salary, I'll provide housing for you, I'll provide transportation for you, I'll make sure you can get there and get home. <coughs> no way. I could not do that. Our church as a whole could not do that. So we combine our efforts together with other churches and we do that together. But the church sends them out. So we really find the church in Antioch sending out Barnabas and Saul. Look on down in verse 9 of chapter 13. But Saul, but Saul, who also is also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him. And I think I, I don't think again after that he's referred to as Saul. I think from that point on, he's referred to as Paul. From Antioch, they went to Seleucia. 
from Seleucia, they went to Cyprus, to Salamis, to Paphos, to Perga in Pamphylia, to Presidia in Antioch, and then on to Iconium. You see the progression. It is the method of God. It is the New Testament method of spreading the gospel. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, go to back again in chapter 15. Let's look at a few verses there. And then we're going to go back to chapter 14. In chapter 15, verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. And Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with him also. But Paul insisted that they should not take him. They should not take him along who had departed them in Pamphylia and had not gone with him to the work. And there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him, sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So now we got two sets. Now we got two pair. Now, again, Mark had uh, apparently being a very young man and he had gone out with them and either became discouraged or homesick or both. I, I'm not sure which. <clears throat> but uh, he wanted to go back home, so he did. And he left uh, Paul and Barnabas and went back home. That's what Paul is referring to here uh, when he didn't want him to go again. Now, so let's go to chapter 14, where our lesson is today. Now, oftentimes, and we've already made reference to it, we think of every time they go out, they have great success. Now, we talked about Philip and the great revival in Samaria. We talked about the great throng of people who converted after Paul preached on the day of Pentecost and then others were added. <clears throat> but in verse, let's read the first five verses of chapter 14. It came about that in Iconium, so now that's, this is where they are now, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a great multitude believed both of Jews and Greeks. Great result, right? great harvest people are getting saved but the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren now that's that's uh, step number two of brother Steve's point number one of how he detains us in other words he gets us sidetracked the enemy gets us sidetracked or distracted, occupied with other things. Opposition comes. So everything was going good. Great multitudes believed, both Jews and Greeks, but now trouble comes. Therefore, <clears throat> they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands so God was really blessing their work wonderful things were happening but the multitude of the city was divided and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles and when an attempt was made by both, Jew, by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derby and the surrounding area. 
success, but with great persecution. People being saved, but still great problems. Now help me here a minute. Let's ask ourselves why there is opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls it good news. Why is there opposition to the gospel? What? Why are there? Ed? I'm sorry? In other words, I don't know if that's how you spell that or not. In other words, I like it the way it is. Don't cause any ripples. Leave us alone. Status quo. Now that's one way of opposing the gospel. But they're about to kill these guys. There was a little more there than just a disturbing the status quo. What? What? Why else do you think, even today, why? Why is it that you cannot build a Christian church in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> I think he does too, Brother Bob. Power, position. Authority, I tried. Hey, there you go. Why'd those guys get so upset with the, about the little uh, girl that cast that demon out of? Are there other reasons? Why, why can you not... Why is there anybody that would be resistant or oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ? Okay. How do you spell religious? O U S. Is that right? Religious. <laughs> I mean, I got degrees. I mean, I got college degrees. And how you, how you spell religious? Is that how you spell it? You know what I'm writing up in. Really? <laughs> All right. Huh? How you spell bias? Is that bias? <laughs> I could put B U Y O S U S by us. Yeah. Why? Why? You know, and I'm, I'm serious. Here these men are, and they're sharing the good news of Jesus, and people are believing, people are being saved, but then they start to rise up in opposition. I won't just put conviction. I believe I can spell that. Conviction. Convicted of personal sin, which the gospel will do, will create in a lot of people a great deal of anxiety, fear, and opposition. And usually, usually, those in opposition will attack the messenger because they can't deal with the with the message, so they attacked the messenger. So everywhere these guys went, they found success, but they also found opposition. And there's a lot of strife and division and threats here at Iconium. So now verse 6, they went on down to Lystra and Derby. 
verse 7. And they continued to preach the gospel. And at Lystra there was sitting a certain man without strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, he had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, <clears throat> who when he had fixed his gaze upon him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the multitude saw that Paul had done this, they raised their voices. The gods have come among us. It's amazing how people react to different things. So here they are in Lystra, Derby. I'm not going to take time to read all of this, but uh, let's eat, let's move on down. Verse 19. But Jews from Antioch and Iconium, having won over the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. And you don't read of converts in that city. You, you don't, because here was a town that was absolutely heaped, heaped in pagan, heathen religion. They wanted to believe that Paul and Barnabas were gods. Zeus and Hermes, they called them. The priests of that religion brought animals and wanted to sacrifice them to these guys. They were so blind. We read, we read did we not, then in verse 7, that they continued to preach the gospel. But they're now in a situation, in an area where the ungodly religion is so powerful and so strong, they can't make any headway. And not only that, now they stone in them. They were, and, and because they, they, they came, they'd already stirred it up in Iconium. And, and they found out about the plot to kill them there. So these same people come down to Lystra and Derby and get the people all stirred up again. And they're, they're, they're about to stone them. Look at that just a moment. Um, where were we? But Jews came from Antioch in Iconium, verse 19. And having won over the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. I'm of the, and, and I, I can't, in my mind, I think it's the Jews that stoned them. Not the people of Lystra and Derby. They thought they were gods. But these Jews come and they finally get to do what they had planned to do in Iconium. Zealots, yeah. Yeah, these Jews were zealots. Paul one time said they had zeal but didn't have any knowledge. Uh, and uh, but what, what would have been your response about now if you were Paul and Barnabas? What would have been your response about now uh, in, in your vocation of being a missionary? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure uh, a lot of that went through his mind, but I mean, th this, is, this is the converted Saul. This is a man completely sold out, and he's getting, he's getting what he gave. That's, that's what you're talking about. He, he was getting what he gave. And, uh, but 
I don't know if that had been you. What after this? You know, I'd probably want to go back home. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, uh, I I don't know. I wouldn't want it to give up. Well, it probably did. I think from what Paul said and what Paul wrote later, uh, I think it even it did that. But he, huh? Yeah. But Paul, and you, you read where Paul said how many times he was beaten, how many times he was shipwrecked, how many times he was in the cold, how many times he was all these things, and he lists all these things that happened to him. But never once in all of Paul's writings, never one time do I ever see Paul being the victim. I never hear him saying, Oh, poor me. He did it all. He did it all for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he would not, he would not give up. I would have probably given up long before now. So, <clears throat> on down in verse 20 to Derby. While the, the disciples stood around him, he arose and entered the city. <laughs> they thought he was dead. They done stoned him. So he gets up and goes back into the city. And the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. <coughs> and after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So they're Th these journeys. Now, again, you don't read you don't read of churches established in every one of these places. Now, let's go back. <clears throat> where where was I? In verse twenty one, they returned to Lystra to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, they appointed elders in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed, and they went on. You see the pattern? You see the organization? You, you see there's, they're being put together an entity that can continue on. Putting to, This is God's plan. This is God's way. This is, this is what Jesus was talking about. This is what Paul was talking about when he talked about the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ living in this world today. You and I are parts of the body of Christ. Paul spent a lot of time talking about the fact that the body has many members. Not all members have the same responsibility. Some are more noble than others. Some are more value than others. But I cannot imagine any part of my, now I lost my hair, and I don't grieve over that. It was not absolutely necessary for life, was it, Brother Bob? We can do without our hair. Ladies, uh, we can do without our hair. But I can't think of much else that is part of a body that you can do without or that you would want to do without. No, it's not like losing your teeth, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, okay. Uh part of a body. Every member has a function. Every member has an important function. That's the description of the church. That's the body of Christ. That's the, the entity. That's the entity that is being put together in all of these cities. Now, Paul had never uh, Paul had never pastored a church. Paul had never uh, 
been anywhere at any length of time, not yet. He will later. He'll stay at places sometimes for more than, more than a year, but right now he's not done that. So he's strengthening and they're appointing elders. They're choosing leadership for the church. It's an amazing thing to me to see how the Lord Jesus, through these men, began to put together in these local communities an institution, a body of believers that could continue on with the work. The missionaries, Paul and Barnabas in this instance, they could not be everywhere in all of these towns at the same time. So in each one, they establish a church. In each one, they, they establish leadership in these churches to continue the work to grow the church, to magnify the gospel, and to spread the gospel. And they would just go through, how y'all doing? Everything going okay? Just want to encourage you. Keep on keeping on. Hang in there. God's with you. Lord's faithful. Holy Spirit's with you. Keep on going. Keep on winning. Keep on reaching. Keep on teaching. Keep on baptizing. That's the Great Commission, isn't it? Go and preach, teach, baptize. And these local churches and these local communities that these men were establishing, that's what they were doing. The Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ could only be accomplished through the church. That's why it is so important for every believer to be a part of a local church. And not only to be a part of it, but to serve in it and to work in it. That's the plan of the Lord Jesus. That's the reason for the church. Because it, it, there's a place for all. There's a place for everybody. But everybody can't just sit. Everybody can't stand in the pulpit. Everybody can't be a deacon. Everybody can't be this or that or the other, but we can all be involved in the work of the kingdom. I don't think it was this past time, but the time before when we had uh, had an event at church in the fellowship hall where all of the volunteers were recognized. I, I don't know if y'all remember that or not. But it, it just, it was amazing to me. As we looked at different programs in the church and the volunteers that were working in that. And before the night was over, over 300 volunteers were identified by name and what they were doing in the church. Over 300 volunteers that were involved in all the different programs of the church. It's amazed me. But that's what it takes. We all have a part. We all have a task. We all have a responsibility. So often, and I've seen this through the years, and you have too, is that uh, uh, I come to church for what I can get. Well, I do that to a, to a degree. I come to church because I, I get a lot of uh, love from you guys. I like to come to church because I get a lot of encouragement. I come to church because I get to see people worse off than me. You know, that sort of helps me up, you know, encourages me. Or I come to church and I see uh, uh, people with uh, uh, wonderful uh, wonderful. Uh, expressions of grace and love and encouragement. I love to come to church. I love to come and hear the, my pastor preach. I love to come and hear the music. I, 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 come, I get all kinds of things. I receive a lot. I really receive a lot when I come to church. But do we come to church for what we can get? Sure we do. Nothing wrong with that. But then there's the other side to that. What do we give? We receive. What do we give? 
Do we give our time? Do we give our, our efforts in volunteering here, there, and yonder? Uh, do we give our tithe, God's tithe back to Him? Do we support uh, other programs of the church where we give above and beyond the tithe? Do, do, what do we do? What are we giving? What are we giving? It's a two-sided thing. But the church, the church is the central entity that Christ has established in order for the Great Commission to be performed. And there are so many things involved in that. In Jerusalem, I guess Springfield for a lot of us, that's our Jerusalem. Judea, maybe the county, maybe the state, it just keeps going out and it ends up in the uttermost parts of the earth. But it all starts at, at the level of the church. And the church starts at the level of the individual believer who is sold out, committed, and surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Filled with faith. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's the same thing in each of us that Jesus said to Simon Peter, upon this, upon your faith, upon this Indwelling, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're part of an entity that God has put together. On down in verse uh, 21 again. <clears throat> After they had preached the gospel in th to that city and had many disciples, made many disciples, they returned to Lystra to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls, appointing elders, fasting and praying. And then they went on to Pisidia, came into Pamphylia. They spoke the word in Perga. They went down to Adaliah. From there they sailed to Antioch from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had accomplished, they made full circle. Full circle. Imagine what was accomplished in the process of that circle. Imagine what was accomplished in that circle they made. The churches that were formed, the churches that had leadership now, the churches that had an organization now, churches that had a commission now, that in all these cities, here were these churches, no doubt small, no doubt small, no building, just a group of people meeting together somewhere, somehow. And in every one of these towns, the gospel was being preached and taught but it started with those who went and established the work. They went from town to town, strengthening the disciples. Strengthening the disciples, the followers, and encouraging them to remain true to their faith. It's an amazing task. How did Paul figure all this out? How did Paul know the Lord had to have told him. The Lord had to have told him, this is what you do. This is how you do it. This is how it's accomplished. Now, earlier, we went back through uh, the, the events of Philip, uh, Peter, uh, in different places. Often, like Philip and the, and the Ethiopian, Peter and, and Cornelius, uh, we find one on one. But we find the continuation of the gospel. Now, we, now say, well, uh, Cornelius was converted up in, uh, in Caesarea. Well, we're going to find out a whole lot more about Caesarea as we continue on in these journeys. We're going to find out a whole lot more about a, whole, a lot of these places. As the gospel continues to spread, we're going to see more and more successes. We're going to see more and more persecution. We're going to see more and more hardship. 
as the journey goes along. And of course we know eventually it's going to lead to some of them dying. Dying. Dying for the cause of Jesus Christ. Well, we've looked at Paul's first missionary journey. He's gone the full circle. He's established churches. Been a lot of converts. Been a lot of problems. But the churches, and I keep saying this because this is so crucial, is that in all of these places, there's a local church continuing to spread the gospel, living the Christ life in front of their neighbors and others. The Lord is continuing to be glorified in all of these towns because there was a church there. A church there. Now you think just a moment, and I'm going to close just a second. You think of what a vacuum would be created in this community if suddenly there were no longer a Grace Baptist Church. It's gone. No longer a North Springfield Baptist Church. Springfield Baptist. Epiphany. All these. Down Greenbrier, the work. Grace and Greenbrier. Calvary. South Haven. All of these churches. What if suddenly there was no church? That's how this world's going to be after the rapture. I can't imagine that. Well, let's pray together, and uh, I want to dismiss us, and then we're going to turn the, the, the uh, camera off, and we're going to take prayer requests, okay? Father, thank you today for Jesus. Thank you for the example that we see in front of us in your word. You know, I read Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and I just, I just say, Lord, how? How can that happen? How can that ever happen? And then immediately, immediately when you go back to heaven and you send the Holy Spirit, immediately the very means of it happening are there functioning with power and great strength. And thousands upon thousands are saved. Father, again, Even through this, show us how much we can trust you. That there's never anything, any task, any opportunity that you call us to. That you haven't already figured out how it will be done. And put in place all that's needed to accomplish it. All you need is our availability. You'll take care of the rest of it. Paul and Barnabas were available. Peter, Philip, others were available. But you put it all together. You gave them wisdom and discernment. You showed them how to do it. Father, may we never, ever underestimate the value of the local church or underestimate the necessity for every one of us to serve in the local church in some capacity. It's your body. It's the entity that you have brought into life to carry the gospel, to fulfill the Great Commission. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.